Thank you. Assistance for the folks who are online. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to jump in to ask questions. Uh, I will not be looking at you in the screen because there are actually real people here. Uh, and I'm going to keep looking at the real people. Uh, but again, feel free to ask questions. So what I thought I would do was start with some background on what, how the Good Place came about as a show. Uh, then talk about how the book came about. So it came out of some of the interactions from the Good Place. Say a bit about the content of the book, uh, and then we can just open for whatever whatever you like. But the show itself, it, it, it was, it's kind of weird to think that there is a show about ethics on a major network. So people wonder, how did this come about? And look, there was, there's convergence of two things. One is that Michael Schur was, uh, he was the head writer on Saturday Night Live, uh, co-creator of Fox and Rec, uh, co-creator of Book of 99. And basically he made NBC a boatload of money. And they said to him, you can do any kind of show you want. Right? We'll, we'll, we're going to give you quite a lot to do a show. Now, at the same time, what, was hap what happened was his wife had an incident. I, I call it the sob story. What it is, is that his wife was in LA in traffic because if you're in LA, you're in traffic, right? And she hit the back of the sob uh, and dented the sob. Not a bad dent, but a dent. And she got, she got out of the car, you know, how do you do this information? Uh, and the guy sent her a bill for like $800 for this scratch on the back fender of the sob. And my sure thought this is outrageous. Same time Katrina was going on. So it, the back of your car, and I'll take that 800 and I'll donate it to Katrina. The guy said, no dice, right? We're not gonna, he says, I wanna fix the fender, I want the 800 bucks. So Mike started thinking, well, look, what would it take for this guy to say, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll just forego the money. So he started a campaign, fortunately not saying the guy's name, but giving an instant and asking people to donate. And he was going to keep confronting that. Well, now it's like 10,000, now 15,000. And, and Mike knows people with money, right? He's from Hollywood. And so what, he, what happened was he quickly got to 25, 50,000 bucks. And he started to feel a little sick about it, but he wasn't sure why. So he called up, he cold called some ethical philosophers. And they told him everything from you're an asshole, right? To, yeah, that's cool, you should do that. So he was trying to think about it, but then he sort of realized, look, this is something, Katrina is something this guy has nothing to do with, right? He didn't cause Katrina. So why am I making him pay for something, Katrina? So he fessed up to the guy, apologized. Uh, said, look, your name never went out there, uh, and said, I'm just going to send you the 800 bucks, and then wrote everybody who had well, done it. said, look, would you mind just donating? But, you know, they all donated. The guy said, look, I'm going to take the 800 bucks, but I think I might wind up sending it to a Katrina fund. Mm -hmm. So, but now, so that was that was the background story. What it did was it made me think about ethics. Right? So, it was getting this range of philosophers and this range of views. He was unsure what to do. He felt he'd done something wrong, but it was a little unclear how to think about it. So he wanted to think about ethics more. And this is where the show came in. He said, he said to NBC, I'm gonna pitch you a show about ethics. And apparently they took a deep breath and said, okay, uh, you've gotten successful shows for us before, so you can try this one. And that's was the origin of the show itself. So in the show, there are a number of ethical theories, none of mostly Western ethical theories that, that come up. Uh, and they, they, they come in various guises. Uh, if you follow the show at all, uh, you'll know that, they, uh, that there are countings that are done, how much good you've done gets points, and how much bad you've done gets points. And that reflects one theory, which I'll get to in a moment. That then there's the, uh, a philosopher, Chidi, uh, an African philosopher, who actually exemplifies another theory. But the theory that Mike was most interested in actually appears sort of through the show quietly uh, and comes up much more in the book. I guess we'll get to the book in a bit. But so 
that was the structure of the show. Now I got involved because Mike read a little book that I had written on that. Uh, it's a little, it's a little book called that. And apparently there was, I, I caused some small marital tension because mm -hmm. the book, if you have to picture the book, it's a, it's a basically a gray book with a raven on the cover and it just says death. And he was reading it in bed before he went to sleep. And so he brushes his teeth and bring his book death. And he said, at one point, his wife looked at him, I'm not sure the marriage is going to survive this show. <laughs> but it did. And, and, and he emailed me because that's what he does. He'll just email people who he thinks he'll have something to say. And said, look, I, I'm a showrunner. I'm doing a show, which I had not heard of. Would, uh, would you be okay to talk about issues of death and mortality and morality and stuff like that? And I didn't, I didn't know who he was. So I, said, I looked him up. And my, my daughter's favorite show was Parks and Rec. And then I realized who this guy was. And I, and I said to my wife at dinner that night, I said, this guy doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to be on the set. So I emailed him back. I said, you know, instead of like a phone conversation, why don't we, this time there's one of Skype, why don't we Skype? And we Skype for like two hours. We got along really well. And so one thing led to another. We were Skyping a good bit. Uh, eventually, I started reading some of the scripts for the show, you know, to make sure they were close off the actor. And over the course of it, this is like, so it's four seasons, right? Ended in 2020. Over the course of it, this guy got to know a lot of philosophy. Uh, and so what we did, what, what I did, is once I said, look, why don't we do a book, right? I mean, you, you've got all this background, right? And you're, I mean, you're, you're a famous guy or a great writer. But let's do a book together. And so we decided that he would write the book and I would uh, advise him on the philosophy. And he's a perfectionist. Uh, I told Stephanie before the, the, the event began, I said, there was a point very late in the process when the publisher, Simon Schuster, was trying to pry the manuscript from his hand. He kept going back to me, I said, is this right, is this right? So, I, I'm, and I'm on this email thread and I, the editor, Mike, you've got to get us the book because it's got to go into production. And I get an email from Mike. It's a tie. This is a footnote on page 156 uh, that refers to an article. Would you mind rereading that article and making sure I've got the footnote exactly right? So he really was a perfectionist about every step, every step. Uh, and he was worried. He said, look, a lot of going to criticize this. And I'm not really, I'm sort of a, you know, I, I'm a New York guy, so this is my response. I said, look, there are philosophers who will criticize this and who will say you misinterpreted this question, but they'll be wrong. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and we've gotten by, actually, we've gotten unscathed so far uh, in those reviews by philosophers. So we're okay there. So the book came about just because. Um, Mike wanted to, you know, well, I suggested it and he thought, yeah, let's, let's pull this all together. Uh, Simon and Schuster approached him actually, uh, when they found that he was going to write a book, he'd never written a book before, right? A lot of people wanted the book. So when we met with the presses, right, that his agent set up a meeting in New York, so we met with the press, uh, and you know, they were all the press, you know, Simon and Schuster, uh, Harper and Rowe, Knopf, Penguin. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, all these editors that I'm meeting, not only would they have not responded to any email I would have ever sent them, they would never have seen the email, right? Because email would have gotten to their administrative assistant and then just been deep sick right from that. So I'm, and I'm looking at these people and thinking, you guys have no idea, right, that how thrilled I am to watch you ask us to write a book for you. <laughs> but, so the book I read. So let me talk about the book a little bit. The idea behind the book was not to be, and we and we made this decision that very early on, it's not simply the continuation of the good place. Now, there are references to good place. Actually, if you see the, the, the cover of the book, there's a the cover of the book is a good place reference. But it, it, it's like for the effort people who know it. But the, the idea was that people who are not philosophers. Struggle with ethical issues or struggle with ethical issues every day. So the question is, 
how might somebody who's reflected on this, who's not a philosopher, how might he be engaged in this? How might he be thinking about this? Right? What, what, I want to, I want to use the word, not advice, but perspective that he might get in thinking about right, how to move forward. Of course, right, as the title is ironic, right? Um, uh, and in fact, very early on, uh, he said, look, none of us are going to be perfect, right? I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a bit. But the idea then is to present for the first few chapters, several major theories of West, Western ethics. And then the rest of the book deals with dilemmas. Right? Can I take a moral holiday? Is it okay to claim credit for what I've done? But at one point, he describes himself uh, at a Starbucks where he gets a coffee that's like a dollar seventy-five, and there's like a quarter left, and he's going to drop it in the chip jar. But he, he realizes that he waits until the barista turns around before, so they can see him drop this quarter. Right? <laughs> this, guy, this guy makes like twenty-five million a year. See <laughs> this quarter into the chip jar. Right? How, how do how do we think about that? So he starts with some of these theories and then works his way to you know. Dilemmas that we face. So, is it okay to watch uh, movies by people who turn out to be horrific? Right? Uh, and at the end, he talks about the what he thinks. And we had a long discussion about this. What he thinks is the most difficult and important thing that one can do in everyday ethics, which is to say, I'm sorry. Uh, he said, and I said, we, we actually had a discussion about this because I said, I think thank you is more important, right? I think I'm sorry is more, but I think people need to say thank you all the time. And his response, yeah, but thank you is too easy, right? I'm sorry is hard. Right? So you have, to learn, you have to learn the hard thing, I'm sorry. But he practices all of these discussions with um, talk about ethical peers. And I'll say a little bit about those. In Western philosophy, over the last 2,500 years, there have been basically three major types of ethical theory. Uh, one coming from ancient, and then two modern. I'm going to talk about the modern ones first, and we'll go back to ancient. Because the modern ones have something in common, even though they diverge. The ancient ethics does something else. And ancient ethics was, it was completely marginalized for hundreds of years. But in the last 50 or so years, it's come back and it's huge. But I'll get to that in a minute. So the, the two major classes of what's called modern moral theory, modern ethical theory, are consequentialism and deontology. Consequentialism, and, and if, if you've heard of it, you've probably heard one of the most important variant of it's called utilitarianism. So the idea behind utilitarianism is that the right thing to do is to cause the most good you can do Minus the bad, right? So when you take as much good as you can do, you subtract the bad, and you pick the one that has the most positive left over. And if any, obviously, if they all come up negative, you don't do anything. So it it has a sort of kind of a mathematical basis to it, but what it focuses on is results. Right? It's consequence, like what consequences? It's results. It's what happens. What matters morally is the results of what you. It's not the intentions, the results. And this can lead to some very strange places. So, for instance, right, uh, and I just want my student that isn't the math and COVID stuff, I, just, I, I bring a student in front of the room. I have a student face to So, you imagine somebody. I said, Look, suppose we're like waiting for a bus. Like, you and I stand here, we're standing in front of waiting for a bus, and the bus pulls up, and I push you, put it up. Now, you stop in front of the bus. Right? The bus doesn't hit you as you roll right in front of you. Unbeknownst to you, and unbeknownst to me, there was a bicycle rider coming from the other direction, and it's completely spaced. If I had not pushed you for the bus, the bicycle rider would hit you and driven you into the bus at the end of you. So, the question I ask you, did I do the right thing? If you're a utilitarian, if you're consequentialist, I did do the right thing. I did it by accident, but what tells for the consequentialist, for the utilitarian, is the results of the action. 
So what they would say is, I was trying to do the wrong thing, but wound up doing the right thing. All right. So for the consequential, so you still carry it, right? that I, I uh, that the case of what they would call, what they call moral luck. Right? I got lucky morally. Now, just to, to people look and think, well, I, that must make that theory wrong. I say, well, look, if, if you suppose you brought me in front of a, a utilitarian judge. And the judge had to decide whether I should be punished or not. Not legally, right? but the judge is still that. And I asked myself, would the judge punish me? And most of them say, no, because you did the right thing. I said, no, the judge would punish me. Why? Because the judge is an utilitarian. The judge wants to cause the best consequences. And punishing me for doing it will likely cause better consequences than not punishing me. Right? Because you let me go, I'm just going to keep doing it. So, in fact, for the utilitarian, you can be punished right, for your self tenure reasons for doing the right thing by law. But it's all result. Everything's all result, result, result. For the deontologist, it's not the results that matter, but the means, what all kinds of the intention. Right? It's what I intend that matters. But here's the top question what determines the right intention? Right? How do we know what the right intention is? And the most famous, um, most famous deontologist was the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, right? And couple of, and his his view is called Kantian deontology. And what Kant said is, well, look, what you need to do is ask for a description of the act you're about to perform, and you ask yourself, can I imagine everybody performing that act in these circumstances? And if I can imagine everybody performing that act in these circumstances, I should do it. But if I can't imagine everybody performing this act in these circumstances, I shouldn't do it. So I'll give you a, a pure Kantian example. I'm thinking of lying. Thinking of lying someone. Is this okay? Well, I imagine a world in which everybody's lying. But the problem is, in a world in which everybody's lying, nobody would believe anybody. And if nobody believes anybody, there's no point in lying. Right? Lying won't get you anywhere. So, according to Kant, you can never lie. And when, by the way, when Kant says never, never lie. Right? I mean, not even little lies. Like, like when, when I started to lose my hair, I, I want to, for the record, I do not always look like this. When I, when I started to lose my hair, my wife being a kindly sort, right? So, yeah, you're not losing your hair, right? You're, it, it's fine. You're not losing your hair at all. Now, people, there are mirrors in my house. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but right, the, the idea was that she was being kind. According to Khan, she did the wrong thing because he can't say a lot. But the puzzle here, and remember, I gave you the puzzle for, for the utilitarian. The puzzle here is how do you describe the act you're asking should everybody do it? So here's an example. A friend of yours comes to your house, knocks on your door. Said, look, there's this crazy guy down the street chasing me. Can I hide in your closet? So I can close my bed. No, I got you. No problem. So, no problem. Uh, five minutes later, some crazy looking guy knocks on the door and says, I'm looking for so and so. And they describe the person that's your friend in the closet. And they say, Have you seen them? Now, if you're a constant, you can't lie. So the question is, what do you do? How do you view it? And for most of us, the obvious thing, we just lie. But the Kantian has to find this way around it because they can't lie. So Kant said something like, well, you, you, but you could say that, well, I know that they're often at the store on Tuesday afternoons or something like that. But that's, at least that's uh, it's kind of cheating. Really. So the question is, how do you form that intention? Another way to form intention is, well, it, can I lie in order to save a person's life? Well, you can imagine now everybody saying, okay, that's okay for everybody. So it's, it's tricky how you think of it. The philosophers have written a lot of how you think about the issue of forming the nature of the intention of the act. So these are the two. Now, in the good place, cheating 
is the contact. We know the good part. She is the contact. And she is the guy who can never figure out what the right thing is that he's acting on. Right. So this idea of how do you form the, the, the attention? Like he never is sure what well, can describe the attention this way, and then I do this, and I just kind of describe the attention this way, and then I do that. So the the, the Mike is making fun of Kantian deontology through G, the person who can't figure out how to describe it and therefore can't figure out how to act. So the famous scenes where she's about to sign something and 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 uh, uh, Ted Danson figure says, "Well, you want a, a pen or a sharpie?" and he just stares, he just says, uh, "He's lost, right?" Uh, because he can't figure out what the principle is behind each of each of these. So that's where the contents. The utilitarian of this um, in the point system, right? In the good way. So you get enough points, right? Minus the bad points. And you can't, right? And you get, uh, and you get, in. and it turns out in the good place. The yeah, uh, answer I don't try not to ruin too much, too much of it, that almost nobody ever gets in the good place right? because there's always these unintended consequences of what you do, right? So, and you, you know, in, in one scene where you, you buy a tomato uh, and you buy it from a, an organic place, and it turns out that. Somebody drove 300 miles with that tomato, and uh, and somebody sprayed it with stuff that that, that, that caused the disease over here. So you never know the consequences of what you do, which makes the point system right, kind of stacked against you. So knowing that you're going often to fail, how do we think about that? This leads to the ancient theory. So the ancient theory goes back to Aristotle, and it's often called Aristotelian ethics. Aristotelian ethics doesn't evaluate people act by act, is this the right act, is that the right act? What the Aristotelian does, and it goes back to Aristotle, is the interesting thing is not right, this particular act, but what kind of person you're creating yourself to be. And so they're interested less in the ways you evaluate the specific things you do, and more in what kind of character are you creating yourself to be. And for our side, the idea is to create yourself to be what a person of what we call virtues. Right? Uh, and those, those, you can imagine these virtues are the courage, magnanimity, uh, he, he actually has uh, friendliness, he doesn't have, but you would probably have patience. Uh, but, but the idea then is you're not asking yourself act by act, you know, is this right, is this right, is this right, but trying to mold yourself to be a certain way. And this became the theory that really grabbed Mike as the show was going on. There's nobody that enslaves you. But if you see the show, you can actually see the Aristotelian ethics unfolding in that people slowly becoming better and better and better as they keep trying. And in, in that, um, for our side, right, it's necessary for a person to become a person of virtue. It's necessary for them to have a community that people that help do that. And now for our side, that community has to have people who are already virtue. But what the, the show does is that it shows a community of people who are not virtuous and yet can, through a community, right, a flawed individual, help make one another better. And how do they help making one another better? By pointing out when they're failing, by, uh, by pushing them a little bit here, pushing them a little bit there. So, what you have then is moral growth. And what Aristotle is about is being able to grow morally. And for Mike, the key component in all this, and this this doesn't go back to Aristotle so much, but I think you can see it in a second. And it's a word that, and when you got an interview, all that came up is try. Like you're going to fail, you're going to fail a lot, but you just keep trying. You, you try each time, you learn from your mistakes, you say, I'm sorry, and then you try to do better. And he saw in the Aristotelian picture the possibility. For moral growth through trying and failing over and over again. And so, in, if you, in the show, right, 
the idea of people slowly getting better at prescribing keeps coming up. In the book, he focuses a lot on trying and failing. There's a quote I gave him, it's a bit out of context from Samuel Beckett, uh, try again, try again, fail again, fail better. Uh, and it's often used as an encouragement. It's in Beckett's play, it's actually used in, in a cynical way. He says, says Beckett. But, <laughs> then, uh, but the idea uh, is that you, you keep trying and you keep trying to get better and better and better. And, and that seems to be a recipe for more growth. And for Mike, he came the theory that he was most attached to. And when I say most attached to, it's not that he thinks the other theories are useless. But, uh, uh, utilitarianism, for instance, uh, is, can be awfully useful in a pandemic. Because in a pandemic, you have to make really tough decisions, right? People come in, you have to triage them in the hospital. How do you triage them? Uh, well, you, you have to triage them in terms of their uh, parameters like, is the person younger, right? Uh, is, uh, is the person healthy and likely, right, to be able to, uh, and this be early on, right, likely to be able to continue on. Well, there's, there's a number of factors, and you've got to sort of add them up and sort them out, and eventually you wind up doing a utilitarian kind of an analysis. There's room for constant deontology, or at least room for deontology, because intentions matter, right? And, and if we're trying to be better people, one of the things we can do is ask ourselves, yeah, what am I really intending? And so there's room for all of these views, but ultimately he thinks that the Aristotelian picture right, of a picture of a person growing ethically is the picture that he finds the most attractive. And that, again, that comes across in the book, the first chapter is by Aristotle, uh, and then uh, utilitarianism, and then Kantian anthology, and then he goes into various issues. Uh, you know, here's something that, that you might run across in terms of you know, can I take a moral holiday? Is it okay to um, uh, um, is it okay to take so a lot of credit for what I do? Under what conditions uh, must I apologize? He does, uh, and I don't want to. Here I, I really don't want to run the book. Uh, in the chapter on apologizing, he has announced that oh. You don't remember, but the, the representative, I think it's Ted Yoho, insulted uh, AOC. I think he called her a bitch, right? And he was called out for it. And he gave an apology, which started off as kind of vaguely like an apology <laughs> and wound up saying, I'm not going to apologize for representing the American people, right? This, and he analyzed the entire, it was a, like, it takes three or four pages, analyzing sentence by sentence the entire movement of the apology, right? <laughs> and it's just out of work. Yeah. So he's got, um, uh, it, he, the, the book, or I mean, I've given this lots of books, Bob, because I can do the philosophy and he does the funny, mm -hmm. right? But the, the book is a, it's a page turner. Uh, I've read parts of this book when, when it's being produced five, six, seven times. And there were parts I was like, the fifth or sixth time, I'm still laughing. Right? Seventh time, maybe not so much. But <laughs> the, the, it was, it, it's a, a book that's funny, but it captures the, the depth of really trying to grapple with being a good person, knowing right, that it's complicated, uh, that we're often gonna fail, uh, but that it's worth trying to keep going. And he's known as, uh, Mike is known as like one of the guys with the great integrity in Hollywood. And I think if you have any integrity at all in Hollywood, you're doing okay. Right? <laughs> but he's, 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 just, he's got this reference. And as a result of it, he gets a lot of the best writers, doesn't feel want to be with him. So I talked about the show a bit, I talked about the book a bit, but, and again, I don't want to talk to you for now, I don't even know how long I'm talking about it. But, why don't we just jump into questions? Right. All right. I'm going to the live folks. <laughs> yeah. Raise yeah, the know. rain. It's only getting worse out there. Yeah. There's going to be a hurricane by seven. So <laughs> before the apocalypse hits, uh, I want to give you guys a, a chance to, to, to ask questions or make a comment or anything more. 
I will I will jump in, but I want to give you all a you go first and okay. fire us. <laughs> oh, oh, well, no pressure. <laughs> um, so um Michael Shore talks a little bit about this at the at the beginning of the book, which I really appreciated, about how he chose what philosophical theories to talk about. And um, as you mentioned, his writing is hilarious. And so he's basically just like, get up off my back about the people I didn't include that you thought I should have <laughs> include, included, which I really appreciated. Because as you mentioned, it is it is basically honing in on Western yeah. you know, philosophy. And so there is a lot that's left out yeah. in terms of how we might think about asking and answering ethical questions for ourselves. Yeah. And so I just wanted to invite you to maybe um, talk a little bit about um, what might have ended up on the cutting room floor uh, for the show and for the book, um, and 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 why potentially um, because you know there's a there's so much to choose from and what people might consider next in terms of you know they've watched the Good Place they've read this book they're interested in digging a little deeper um, but what are some of the things that might be missing from this picture um, that might continue to feed someone who's, who's, good, who's good. digging into ethics. Okay, so there are, we, we can have two biases, or at least into two biases. This is a, it's a little simplistic, but okay. So one is he, he doesn't use religious ethics. Right? Uh, and there's a lot of the religious ethics in ethics, Paul Tillich, uh, Mark Gruber, folks like that. Um, I, and that goes back to the show as well. He, he didn't want the show to privilege any particular type of religious tradition. Uh, so he's trying to widen it. It's not hardly anti-religious. Like there's people die and they go to the good place or the preferred good place. Right? So, so there is that. But he did, was very careful not to try to privilege one tradition or another, uh, which means that he wasn't studying those. So when the book comes out, like the book doesn't reflect that. Um, the book also doesn't reflect that because I'm not a that, and I'm the guy who buys seen the book saying read this or read this or read. This. Um, and the other thing which I don't know terrible much about is Eastern one. Uh, well, Eastern and African philosophy. African philosophy actually does make an connection. Uh, we, we, we studied uh, a little bit of Ubuntu uh, concepts in African philosophy that people are tied together. Uh, and so he, he uses that, and we, we sort of study that a bit together. But he worked on that. Uh, and But in Eastern philosophy, there's Buddhism, there's Confucianism. And, and again, I'm only passively familiar with some of these things. That I, and if he were to incorporate all of them, then the book is a bad one, right? Um, but I would say religious thinkers like Google and Philip are great places to go to think about ethics. Um, uh, Confucian philosophy, and I would say Confucius, would be good uh, Buddhism has an entire tradition uh, of ethical philosophy. Uh, and there are, and, and here I know the least of it, but outside of the concept of Buddhism, there are African philosophy as well. All of these are, are places people can go. The, in the show, at one point, uh, Chief, this is when she's gone crazy and has this weird soup that he's created. And you might have put that as a. So the, um, the, uh, and the original script says for the last 2,500 years, there's been three main ethical theories. And I said, Look, you need to put the word Western in there. Because right? if you don't put the word Western in there, you're going to get dang. Right? So, it, it, I mean, he focuses on those. That's what he was reading when he goes to a boxer who knows. I, mean, he, he went, I wasn't the only one, the, the main one, but another one of the uh, 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 I mean, you say, I did, 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 did get a lot of good advice, particularly around the philosophers uh, in Canada. Uh, but but uh, if the person was sort of to, to broaden out, I would say those are the places that one could go. Um, you can also delve further, of course, in the Western philosophy, but as Mike said at the beginning, it's not this hard, right? And a lot of philosophers don't do their best to try to make it easy for you. Uh, and I, 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 I criticize a lot of philosophers. You know, say, I mean, look, philosophy has some hard things, but there are things that you cannot be Simple that you got to, you know, you have to be technical, but there's a lot fewer of them than you would think just reading philosophy. 
So I think philosophy has, Western philosophy has not done itself a favor by being this technical uh, and this uh, silent. Uh, um, but, you know, there are Western philosophers that people can read that, are, that would be you know, more or less uh, uh, straightforward. But I would say this book is probably, for Western philosophy, this book is probably yeah. That's probably more than you're after. No, that's great. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, no, and it, yeah, it is, a, it is a great, great starting place. And thank you for yeah. all that. And of course, we'll recommend that folks read your book. Uh, you don't—you don't need to say that for yourself. You don't need to give yourself credit. But we'll. Well, I'll, I'll just say what I try, particularly the last bunch of books I've written. Um, I try to write philosophy that's that has the, I, the way I put it is the machinery is there in the background. But my feeling is that any intelligent person, right, and I, I want to, and I define intelligence quite broadly, should be able. to I think if I if I wrote the book the right way, to read the book and understand what's going on. And the feedback I've gotten from suspect students and whatnot, they always think you can understand it. So, uh, so you know, with several books, I wrote uh, um, a, a Significant Life about meaningfulness, I wrote A Fragile Life about dealing with suffering, and I wrote A Decent Life uh, about, uh, it's these my mileage for the rest of it. Converging in an interesting way with Mike's book, because as I said, with perspective of theories, Got to get you to be the best possible person to be, and we're not going to do that. So, how might we think about our morality if we're not thinking about being the best possible person? And I try to offer a frame for that. So, thank you for opening that and allowing me to. That's what I'm here for. You know, I'm still a bookseller, so. All right. 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 There's more than one book, right? Exactly. Maybe <laughs> so, that's from the line of thought. Yeah. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Something you said, maybe a technical question. You said the three major Western trains of philosophy have been to go back to what, 2,500 years? Is there anything substantially new in the last 2,500 years? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of interpretations of those, like you're at the interpretation of yeah. the alien ethics, but anything? Yes. Because uh, that's, that's very old. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But, um, yeah, so let me say let me say one thing. Uh, quote a philosopher who, who said no, there isn't anything there, right? Uh, I, 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 I think it was Alfred North Whitehead, famous uh, philosopher, said that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato. Uh, and I thought, well, Aristotle can do that. He's not a footnote. <laughs> um, but the thing is that one way to, to think about it is if we were to say, that the best, the way we should act is to have the right intention. Well, the question, how do we think about that? Right? The, the, the Kantian view, right, which is now, of course, only a couple hundred years old, the Kantian view is, is sort of difficult. So there can be ways of asking the question, uh, okay, what, how do we think about the right intention? Or more recent philosophers, <laughs> Excuse me. I've taken a social view. What would be proper social rules that would filter down that everybody should uh, should abide by? So instead of thinking individually, right? Some philosophers have been so, so social. There are questions for if you're a consequentialist, right? There's all kinds of questions about yeah, what are the right consequences? How do we think about this? So a number of consequentialists have moved away from the straight utilitarian cause more happiness. We're thinking, no, we need to have a number of different elements uh, uh, in terms of our consequences. So maybe we should think about, you know, maximizing justice and happiness and beauty and not. But now the question is, how do we think about their relationship? So what's happened, I think, is in many cases, not the development of a new, a entirely new perspective, but the working out uh, of trying to think about how do we work with these questions? There have been some other theories that have come on uh, on the table, um, but a lot of it has to do with thinking about the how we sort out these theories and how we sort out the relationship between morality and the rest of our life. What other values do we have? So for Aristotle, the right way to live is a virtuous life, 
But for Aristotle, that's because this was the way the cosmos was designed for humans to live this life. So the question of, well, what other values should there be wasn't the question for Aristotle. Because this was the way human beings should be. They should live in this way. For the Kantian, morality is it dominates everything, right? Overrides everything. Right? So if there's a conflict between morality and some other value, you, you have to pick the moral value. Largely the case for most utilitarians as well. But recently people have done think, well, morality is important and maybe relevant for us in all kinds of circumstances. But isn't the case that morality ought always to override other values that we have? And there have been critiques of what sometimes called moral sainthood, right? Moral sainthood being the person who just always does the moral thing. Because the kinds of if we all became moral saints, the world would actually lose a lot. I mean, it would gain a lot as well, but it would lose a lot. So there's debates about that. So I think, although there hasn't been much in terms of the larger frame of ethics, right? There's still a lot of consequentialism versus anthology, and now the recovery of Aristotelian ethics. Those frame, broad frames, I think, are still with us, but there's a lot going on in those frames because it's generally thought that the way in, in which they came down to is rethinking and rethinking. So that I think has, it, it has been new. And one of the things that, that I always struggled with when I was coming up is that I just worked on the assumption that moral values right, dominated all of us. Right? That the moral thing was the right thing to do. But now, reading certain philosophers, uh, I start to question that no, maybe in fact the, the, the field of our values, moral values, what I call narrative values in my book, significant life values around meaningfulness, uh, values around art, maybe there's a more complex relationship. So, and what's happened is that people have become, and I'm going to use the term that we use in philosophy, pluralists about value. In other words, not reducing things to a certain value or reducing things to a certain type of value, but beginning to think pluralistically about value. That's not a, something that would have occurred to Aristotle, it's not something that would occur to Kant. I don't think it's something that would have occurred to most of the utilitarians. So, there's lots of new stuff with you utilizing the frames that have come down. Do you, are there any particular contemporary philosophers that you, because you, you said you've been reading people who have caused you to read them, yeah. um, that you would um, add to the list in terms of, you know, someone else that, that folks who are taking next steps might be interested in reading, especially if they're, you know, if they're looking for newer voices in philosophy. Good. So the, I'll tell you my two favorite living philosophers. <laughs> One is a philosopher uh, uh, just retired at uh, UNC, actually, uh, Susan Wall. Uh, and she writes, um, she is deceptively clear. <laughs> and by that I mean that, she, that you read the stuff and you think, well, that feels pretty straightforward, but the stuff that she's doing is deep and challenges some very deep ideas. And she's the person who actually mostly convinced me there's other values here that we should think about a long time. So Susan Wolf uh, at USC, uh, um, there's a political author uh, from Michigan, um, Elizabeth Anderson, uh, who's written, uh, I, actually probably from most famous book, is a set of lectures called Private Government, uh, in which she argues that corporations are doing the kinds of anti-liberal things that governments don't do. And so that what's happened is that authoritarianism has shifted from the state to corporations. Uh, and that's why she called the private government. Uh, uh, and so she gave a series of lectures on that. Uh, but she's, uh, and she's quite good, uh, Elizabeth Anderson. Uh, there are other folks that I've read. Uh, in, in terms of recent thought, a lot of my thought uh, about politics developed out of who's no longer living, but the French philosopher Michel Foucault. Right, uh, and Foucault uh, has he can be uh, really rough, but as he, as he went on later in he decided he, that he was actually going to be comprehensible, uh, partly because he was doing work with prisons, and that forced him right, to actually to, to be able to talk about things in ways that people who were in prisons could understand. So uh, he's been responsible, but among the living philosophers, those two 
there's a French philosopher, I was just mentioning his name, Jacques Rancière, who has written um, some stuff that's influenced me a lot in thinking about politics. The problem is there's a law in French philosophy. And the law in French philosophy is you cannot talk in ways that anybody actually understands. <laughs> uh, it's not something they want to do, but it's the law, right? so they have to do it. Uh, and Rancière is comprehensible for a French philosopher. Right? Uh, but uh, it's not a person I would recommend. So just picking up his book, uh, his books and reading them together. Uh, so those would be at least some places. So. But again, you know, these are people in the Western tradition, but that's what I know of, right? Uh, there is actually, I'll mention, because you have at NYU, uh, Anthony Appiah, A-P-P-I-O. I read some of his stuff. Uh, but he, he, he's, I think he's back with Ghanaian, I think, right? Um, uh, and he's very much in touch with African philosophy as well as Western philosophy. Uh, but again, I hope that some of this stuff, he tends to be mostly Western, but he wrote a book early on called In My Father's House about African philosophy and growing up uh, studying African and Western philosophy. That's, that's quite good. Thank you. Great. The at home audience is, is pretty quiet, okay. so it's on us here in the room. If anybody has any more questions, I'm not allowed to ask the spirit of to look in on things. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Having established that I'm very far from perfect, it's not that you're going to want to do anything. It's just, it's what I'm just curious what you have to say. Yeah, like, do you yeah. think people really are trying to be better? Okay, that's it. Uh, let, let me, let me put that <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, um, I think in general and for the most part, this is, by the way, that's a very actual thing. Right? In general and for the most part, <laughs> in general and for the most part, people want to think of themselves as these morally good people, not morally bad people. And people will go a, a good distance to do that. Um, the, what this means is that very few people, I think, will do something that's morally bad and tell themselves at the moment, this is morally bad, right? They'll justify it, they'll do something. But it's, it's important for people to think that they're morally okay. I don't think this moral exemplar, but it's important for people to think they're morally okay. And that can be worked for. Because if you're pointing out what people are morally failing and they, you can convince them, then they can, uh, they have a, a motivation to change. So what I so often tell my students is that people's capacity for knowing we're doing evil is quite limited. People's capacity for self-deception seems fairly infinite. <laughs> right? And so as a result, people will often do things right, and deceive themselves about what they're doing. And self-deception is really, it's really rough to get that. I call it on self uh, uh, it's, it's a bear. It's, by the way, it's a bear to figure out as well. Uh, but it's a bear to, to, to deal with. Like, there, I, actually, so I saw you, you may realize when I said it's to figure out. I'll just give you the puzzle stuff. <laughs> it has nothing to do right, with the book or the show or anything. But I just love it as a puzzle. Yeah. So if, when we deceive ourselves, we deceive ourselves by aspects of ourselves we don't want to admit to. But well, we do it, right? We don't want to admit that I have this aspect of myself. So we deceive ourselves about these aspects of ourselves that we don't want to see. But uh, if these are aspects of ourselves that we don't want to see, don't we already have to know the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to see in order to hide them from ourselves? And if we do, then it's too late. Mm -hmm. So how do we sort that out? Right? I've, I've written a bit on it. Right? There, there are ways, but it's called the puzzle of self right? Because we deceive ourselves for aspects of ourselves we don't want to see, but don't we already have to know what those aspects are in order to start to hide them from ourselves. And that's good. So I, I think that people, they, they want to think of themselves as good. But they will often deceive. They we will we will often deceive about that, right? And that leads to all kinds of problems, mm -hmm. and even more problems when you have a kind of niche media environment of the kind that we have. 
so that you can have your self-perception reinforced like, over and over again by the ways you choose to expose yourself to certain media or certain people and things like that. But among uh, all the problems of the, of the earlier public culture, one thing that is going to date me is that the one thing that we had was there was common public culture. Everybody listens like all the time, right? Uh, so we were debating, but we were debating on the basis of a certain shared reality, right, which I, I think is now missing. Uh, and that, I think, can really help reinforce that. So how can I make you better? <laughs> <laughs> um, should I get a job so that I can give more money to charity? Okay. I, I, I'm just going to take a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is a philosophy. Can you, can you repeat that question to you just in case folks okay. at home didn't hear? Yeah. So should you get a... Mm -hmm. Actually, let me be quick. Should you get a job that makes a lot of money so you can give it to charity, or should you get a job, period? That, I suppose a, a relatively well paying job would be that. Okay, so like, should you get a well paying job so you can give more money to charity? Um, there's a philosopher, Peter Singer. Uh, and Singer is, uh, the, the term he uses is an effective output. He's a utilitarian. You know, yeah, so his idea is that you should calculate. What the best life would be in terms of giving money. Now, Singer thinks that you should give money to charity. He doesn't think you should support opera, or in that, in that sense, he's, he reduces everything. Right? Morality overrides everything. Okay? And what you should do is give, you know, make a lot of money and give a bunch away. So he has a book called The Most Good You Can Do, in which uh, he talks about. People who made a lot of money and gave a bunch of wet. Um, people who gave away their kidneys because they got two, uh, to strangers. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff there. Uh, and just as a background, uh, so the book I was a decent life, uh, the way that came about was I was talking to my editor at Chicago Press, and I said, you know, I've written a bunch of books, and I said, I don't know if I have anything else to say. She said, well, this is, let me suggest something. She said, this is a book. That I was thinking, if you would write this book, I would like to read it. And I thought, okay, I'm game. Tell me what this book is. So he allowed me to write. And she said, Well, do you know Peter Singer's The Most Good You Can Do? Effective object, giving away kids, like making money and alienating jobs you can give away. And I said, Yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. But she said, I would like you to write that book. Like, I would like you to write The Most Good You Could Do for Sane People. <laughs> uh, and immediately I knew what she was talking about. Uh, and I've been thinking about this idea of moral values don't always dominate all the time. Um, and, and there are debates about this, uh, about how to think about this effective altruism, whether one should be an effective altruist. But, but my own view is that it's great that there are some effective altruists out there. But if I'm going Kantian here, yeah, like, imagine a world in which everybody's an effective we would, on the one hand, right, be solving hunger, right, sorry, uh, diseases. On the other hand, we would lose all of our art, right? Uh, we would lose a lot of what makes interpersonal relationships meaningful, things like that. So, I mean, if, uh, there's no danger that we're all going to be effective altruists. So, if you want to be one, that's great. But I don't think it's incumbent on us. I think it is incumbent on us to think about how we're acting and think about the effects we have. I also agree uh, with my particular point of agreement that, that most of us are going to fail one way or another. Uh, we're not going to be the kind of people that you know, would, would, be, would be moral things. It's, 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 it's nearly impossible. So the question is okay, let me recognize the world I live, let me, or the world I live in, let me try to make that look better within the context of having a life that's also meaningful for me. Uh, not to lose my grip on what would make my life meaningful to where I become a person who's really moral but alienated from that own life. And that's, I think, by the way, one of the roles of philosophy. That philosophy, even if you don't agree with all the theories, philosophy is, gives us opportunities to reflect 
and to think about where we've been and, and where we might go. And so I often think of philosophical reflection as a tool, right? In, the, in a life where you're trying to be better, knowing you're not going to be the best, uh, and allowing us to be able to, to think about that. Right? So I, I, I put it this way. If you're only a psychologist, that's great. Uh, but I give you permission <laughs> <laughs> to, to live a meaningful and decently moral life. Uh, so if somebody comes and says to you, look, you know, you could have done better. We have a concept. Well, we, we are at the top of the hour. But did you have Can we go for one more? Yeah, did you have a question? Just a real short question. Um, I can't. I'm really bad with details, and I actually made an F in philosophy at North Carolina State. I don't <laughs> um, but I, rem I really enjoyed the class. But um, there was what, what's the school of philosophy that says that in human beings, there is no altruism? Like everything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What's that called? Psychological egoism. Ego. Yeah, egoism. Right. So, so there's two types of egoism. Is psychological egoism, which is the view that that's just the way human beings are, right? And then there's ethical egoism, which is that's what human beings should be like, right? So what what you're talking about is psychological egoism. By the way, which has very little to recommend, right? Uh, I mean, you you can always give a psychological egoistic explanation for what you can do, but they become more and more strained as we go on, right? Uh, you know, a guy throws himself on a grenade to say, well, you know, in the last milliseconds of my life, I'm going to feel really good about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're kind of a mixed bag, right? I, I think of egoistic and non-egoistic motives, right? But that, that, that theory, that's like on So, I guess my problem is just the subjective nature of what is right or what's wrong. Um, and what's in the best interest of who? Um, and I don't, I don't know. There's, there's a popular meme now. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a, it's a little dog sitting at his table, drinking coffee, and and the, the kitchen's burning around him. And oh yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. And and so I kind of, you know, and like back when you were talking about, you know, if you push the guy in front of the bus, Sorry. he gets hit or not. Um, you know, ultimately. You could say, well, there's a terrible infringement on his rights and everything, but uh, that's one less person breathing up everybody's air and using resources and everything. So where do you, how do you? Well, here's, let me say this. There, there are some things which are straightforward. Like we should do something about the climate crisis, right? Uh, that, that we, you know, like we shouldn't be racist, right? Things like that, right? So there's some, there's some ethical stuff that's there, right? Actually, I saw yesterday, it was in Burnsville, and I saw a sign in front of the store. It said, please do not enter the store if you have uh, uh, any symptoms of COVID, racism, or homophobia. Right? <laughs> um, so there are things that, like that. Right? But then there are the difficult ones, right? And that's where philosophical reflection comes, right? And so it happens. And it isn't an agreed upon thing. That's the thing that won't be. Some people say, well, there are no answers. I'm like, no, there are things for which we don't have answers yet. But people are working on that, right? And trying to think about it. And then there are things that people thought we would have no answer for, but now we do. So there, there are the ways of acting that I think we you know, uncontroversially say, yeah, we should be we should be supporting those. And then there are the difficult ones, right? And the difficult ones, that's where philosophy comes. So let's try to sort that out. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I I I this I think that's a great way to wrap up. And I just I just want to say it puts me in mind of how the book was with the question of like, should you punch your fun friend in the face, right? <laughs> That's like, again, just, right? Like, should you really punch your friend in the face for no reason? I think is what yeah. they're specifically. So that gives me guinea, and then you just get, then you just get progressively more challenging from there. Yeah. So yeah, so all great questions. Did you want to step in? Oh yeah, I um so um we uh we will end there, and actually if you'll come back up so we can give you another little round of applause.